This morning we are uh, nearing the end of our series entitled Ask Belmar. And I was thinking about this. Um, I worked on the East Coast, helped a guy start a church out there in Delaware. And uh, this pastor told me, he said, listen, you need to have, he called it a sugar stick message. He said, you need to have a message that you can just kind of pull out and preach at any time. And uh, I didn't really take that to heart until the one Sunday when I came in. We had, uh, before Sunday, before the service, we had youth group time and I was the youth pastor. And I walked in and uh, he said, man, I'm really not feeling good. I'm going to go home. So uh, you're preaching this morning. And he, and he left. And I was like, um... And so I, so I had about three, four songs to come up with a message, and then I preached. And uh, I was thinking about that this week, thinking none of these Ask Belmar sermons are going to make my sugar stick file. <laughs> like, those just aren't, uh, they're not going to be there. So our question, what the, the sermon series, we ask people to... Uh, message in or text in or email or write on a card different questions and we're answering some of those questions in this Ask Belmar sermon series. So the question today is this, did God have the ability to stop Hitler from killing six million Jews? And if so, why did he not? So again, another easy one. To go through. But really, uh, as I got to thinking about this, I thought, you know, this is a, a, the question is phrased as a matter of history. But the application is so very relevant to each and every one of us today. Because we all face things where we think, why did that happen to me? Or why did that happen to them? This week, uh, on Thursday, I was uh, sitting on a two-lane highway, stopped, waiting to turn left. And I looked up in my rearview mirror and I saw that a car was coming. And I kind of watched and I thought, are they going to stop? Are they going to stop? And finally, at the last minute, I just, I gunned it. I accelerated because I realized that this car was just going to plow into the back of me. And even though I accelerated away as fast as I could go, still the car would have hit me had they not swerved and gone onto the shoulder and dust flying everywhere. And when I got done, I thought, you know, thank God. Right? I mean, I felt like the Lord was really looking out for me. But then I thought, had I gotten in an accident, would that have meant that the Lord wasn't looking out for me? Because sometimes that's what we think, isn't it? I mean, if I shared that illustration as just part of a message and you got rear-ended this week, or someone you know was severely injured in an automobile accident, wouldn't it be easy to say, well, hey God, why weren't you watching out for me? Why weren't you watching out for them? And so we want to try to answer this question this morning. And the first part of that question is, did God have the ability? Could God have stopped the events that ultimately led to the annihilation of, of six million Jews and, and not to mention all those that were killed uh, in, in World War II and, and, and really that's one of the more famous or infamous uh, acts of evil in our world, but certainly it's not alone. Can God, does he have the ability to intervene in that way? And so we want to look first at God's power. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, is describing Jesus Christ. And it says this, he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. 
And then verse 17 says, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Listen, Colossians says that Jesus created all things, and by him they consist. See, I understand, I have a a mild curiosity. I shouldn't even say a fascination, but I have a curiosity with physics. And specifically, some of these, you know, big ideas about how the world operates. Now, let me tell you, I have a curiosity. I have next to no understanding. I just, I want to be honest with you. I have upstairs a couple of physics textbooks that I understand are some of the best books on this subject. I've read parts of of some of them. Several years ago, I read a pretty in-depth uh, biography of Albert Einstein because I wanted, I, you know, everybody's heard of Einstein, but I wanted to understand who he was and, and it really went into the science of what his theories meant. And it, it mostly just made my head hurt. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. I just, I'm like, that's fascinating, but wow. Wow. And yet Colossians tells me that It is through God that things not just exist, but consist. That they remain as they are. The laws that govern our universe are put there and maintained by God. He didn't just create this world and sort of spin it on its way and leave it. But he sustains it. Jeremiah talks about the power of God when he says in Jeremiah 32 and verse 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. And then he says this, there is nothing too hard for you. And so we're asking the question, did God have the ability to stop this? Jeremiah said, there's nothing too hard for God. Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19 and verse 26, Jesus looked at them after he's talking about the ability of a rich man to go to heaven, but he makes this very familiar statement where he said to them, with men this is impossible, but with God, he didn't say this is possible, he said what? All things are possible. Listen, when you look at things that are impossible, that cannot be done with God, those things are possible. And so the Bible clearly teaches us that God is omnipotent or possessing of all power. He has all power. And we see this expressed in the visions of God. Isaiah chapter 6, really the calling of Isaiah as a prophet of God in verse number 1. And I want to read the first five verses of that chapter. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. High and lifted up was this throne. You know, I joke sometimes that the stage here is just absurdly tall. It really feels that way to me. I mean, I rarely stand up here because I feel like I'd be like, Jesus, you know? It just seems too tall. Now, I understand that the reason they made the stage this tall was the previous pastor. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) The reason they made the stage this tall was to try to help the sight lines in the balcony. Where nobody's sitting, which is why I often like to preach on a step or two. But this says that God was on a throne, not a little bit, but high and lifted up. Listen to this description. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, above this throne, stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. These these majestic beings 
With two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and with two of the wings they flew. And one cried to another. As they're flying about this temple, this throne room, they cry back and forth, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Isaiah says, Woe is me. For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm undone, Isaiah says. As he gets a vision of God, he realizes how big God is and how small he is. Remember when you were a little kid and you'd go somewhere, especially if you'd go to a more expensive store or you'd go to someone's house? My father used to tell me, put your hands in your pockets. My mom would say, don't touch anything. Don't even look at certain things, you know? You ever, you ever been to someplace so nice you didn't want to touch anything? Because you, you know, I know me, and this could not end well. But it wasn't even like that. Isaiah, Isaiah said, I'm undone. We'll not take the time, but I'd encourage you to read in Revelation chapter 4. That whole chapter is another vision of Almighty God. High and lifted up, powerful and mighty. Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 10 and verse 11. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He has made the earth by his power. Talking about Jehovah God. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. The answer to that first part of the question, did God have the power to stop what happened with Hitler and, 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 and the, the Jews, the concentration camps and the, the, the death and the destruction that went on is absolutely. God has all power. And so then, as we look at that, it even confounds us even more why 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 did he not stop that and as I mentioned before that question is historical and I was thinking about other historical things that we look at and and, I, and I'm reminded of the story in Exodus you you're familiar with it Disney made a cartoon about it right that God took this young man, this baby, Moses, and through divine intervention, he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, a Jew, born a slave, but raised up as a, as a child of Pharaoh, or really a grandson raised by the daughter of Pharaoh. And so he was groomed for leadership. He was educated. He was... Uh, he had the, the education and the background that no other Jewish slave would have had. And then he leaves Egypt and God calls him back to lead the nation of Israel out of captivity. And we see God's hand at work, right? And we see how really from birth God prepared Moses. And that's, it's a great story. But do you remember the context of why Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh? His parents hid him because the command of Pharaoh was that they were killing the Jewish male children. And yes, God preserved 
this child, and he was laid in a basket, and he was floated down the Nile, and the daughter of Pharaoh rescued him, and God had a plan. But what about the families whose sons were killed? For them, it didn't seem like such a great plan, did it? I mean, for them, it was tragedy. You imagine being a mother and carrying a child for nine months and delivering a healthy baby boy only to have it snatched away by the authorities and killed? How's that fair? How is that part of God's plan? And again, those are historical things. But for most of us, we don't have to go very far in our own life or certainly in the life of loved ones to see things where we go, how is this fair? How come when the diagnosis comes for this person, they're able to be treated and be healed, but for the person that I care about, the treatment was not effective? Why would God seek to preserve this person and not this one. And we, we say, well, maybe God has a plan, but the truth is that often we don't see it. And even if we do, don't we think, couldn't God's will be accomplished a whole lot easier than that? I mean, let's take the example that we're given in the question, why did God kill six million Jews? What good came out of that? How was that beneficial for our world. Now I mentioned to you that the answer to that first question of did God have the power, the truth is that's a pretty easy question as a pastor for me to, to answer. Because I can go to God's word and God's word in the Old Testament and the new in, in Jehovah God, the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit, he is clearly shown to be almighty and all powerful. But the answer to the second question, why didn't he stop that? The truth of the matter is, I don't know. You say, well, I was hoping for more. <laughs> Me too. But I do want to try to give you a couple of things this morning. Talking about God's ways. The first is found in Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 8. It says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As I kind of meditated upon this this week, it's a bad analogy because it really doesn't illustrate the gap between us and God. But I think back to, I have certain vivid memories of childhood. I can remember times playing outside and literally feeling like I was moments away from dying of thirst. If I couldn't just get to the water hose to get something to drink. I remember, didn't happen but probably once or twice in my growing up, but I remember that there was times when I would throw such a fit about what was being served for dinner that I was sent to bed without any supper. It happened. Clearly, physically, I've recovered. <laughs> Remember laying in bed being hungry. I wasn't tired. I was upset. And all I could think about was how hungry I was. And I literally wondered whether I would make it through the night. I did. I was like, I don't, it, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. And if I do make it, am I going to have the strength to even be able to get up and get something to eat in the morning? I mean, that's what I, you know, in my eight or nine year old brain, that's what's going on. I'm like, you know, I hope my parents are going to be happy. 
And the truth was, I was in no danger, right? And that's funny. And I don't want to use an analogy this morning that makes light of tragedy. But that was the mindset of an eight or a nine-year-old boy. Now, I mean, I've, I've gone days fasting and know that I, I can survive. My, my, my thoughts and my ways have matured. And that's just from a child to an adult. That's not from man to God. And the truth is that, and again, I'm not trying to make light of of tragedy because the things we're talking about historically, the things that we deal with in our own personal lives are, are, are devastating. They're not a joke. They're not just, well, we need a different perspective. But God does say, I have a different perspective. My thoughts and my ways are far above your thoughts and ways. And that's kind of tough to take, to be honest with you. Even when you're a kid, it's tough to take when your parents say, you're fine, and you go, I don't feel fine. And it's tough to take from God when we say, God, this is horrible, and he goes, I'm a loving God. And you say, really? It doesn't feel like it. I'm a good God. And you say, it doesn't seem like it right now. But God said, my ways are not your ways. God also said, my timing is not your timing. And for me, this does give me some perspective. Uh, James chapter four and verse 14, the end of that verse says this, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I don't know if you were up early this morning, but I'm telling you what, I walked out of my house just a little before seven this morning. It looked like Halloween. I mean, the fog this morning was thick. It was thick. I walked outside, it was like, woo. I mean, I expected Scooby, Scooby, do. I mean, that's, it was like that. And you think about, some of you are not going to be able to get that song out of your head for the rest of the day. You're welcome. And you think about those cold, crisp mornings, right? And we've had a few of those where you kind of, and this is such an amazing verse because he said, that's your life. Boom. You think, really? Really? Because it seems a lot longer than that. But that's God's perspective. It's here for a moment and it's gone. Matter of fact, Peter said this in 2 Peter 3, in verse 8, he says, but, 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 but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, uh, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. I mentioned we went to Charleston, South Carolina. I, if you've never been there, it was pretty interesting. Very historic town. You know, I, I, I'm a Colorado guy. The thing about Colorado is nothing's very old, right? I mean, we, we haven't been around that long as a state, just a little bit over a hundred years. Uh, and you go back east, and they've got like 100 years on us. I mean, there's houses in Charleston that were built in the 1700s. And they had gravestones there from the 1600s. And you think, man, this is old. 
Then you go back to Europe and they measure things in, in, in thousands of years. And that blows me away. But then you look at this verse here and he says, listen, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is just a day. And you think, that doesn't make sense to us because our thoughts and our ways are not God's thoughts and God's ways. And his perspective is different. Not only that, but we see a different perspective on God's will. Verse nine there of 2 Peter three, if you'll go back to that, to verse nine, it says this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us. And then it says this, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, God's will is that everybody would repent before Jesus Christ and be saved. Here's my question. Does that happen? The Bible very clearly says it does not happen. That there will be people who do not repent before Christ and who will spend eternity in judgment. But if it's God's will that that would happen, why doesn't it happen? I find a clue to that in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, the beginning of that, uh, Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, hey, teach us how to pray. And I always found it interesting as a kid when we learned this, that Jesus used a little rhyme which I think just kind of came about in the translation. But verse 10 says this, your kingdom come, your will be done, see there, on earth as it is in heaven. Why would Jesus say one of the things that we need to pray is that God's will would be done on earth? Because it isn't always. And the illustration that's used is heaven. In heaven, God's will is always done. That's why it's heaven. But God's will is not always done on the earth. And we ought to pray for that. And so it's not God's will that people die and spend eternity in hell. It's not God's will that we commit atrocities of evil upon one another. It's not God's will that people suffer and are in bondage and in difficult situations. That is not God's will, but it is the result of the sinful world that we live in. And there is an element to God that he doesn't always exert his will on this earth. And yet, the Bible tells us to pray that God's will would be done. The Bible says that God does move at our prayers and that there are times that God does exert his will on the earth. And so the difficulty for us as followers of Jesus, as, as followers of God is, why? Why does he exert his will in some areas and not in others? Why is there time when he does miraculous things and he preserves his people and he protects those and, and, and justice is meted out and, and people are healed and blessings happen and at other times, those things don't take place. Good people die of diseases and, and things that aren't, uh, injustice takes place and, and people get even things that they don't deserve. Why does that happen? And the truth is, we don't always know. As a pastor, I'm often called to minister to people in tragic situations. One of the phrases that I pray to God I never use, I, having been through a few difficult situations, I hate this phrase, everything happens for a reason. Really, what is it? I don't want to, as a pastor, I don't want the follow-up question. Well, what's the reason? I don't know. Does everything happen? For, well, there are reasons why everything happens, yeah. 
but I don't see that we always see them. Sometimes we do, right? I mean, sometimes difficulties in life, I mean, it's a Disney story, isn't it? You know, something tragic happens, but out of that is something great. And then in the end, we all see it and everybody lives happily ever after. We love those stories. But that's not always the way things work out, is it? Matter of fact, God's perspective is a little bit different. Jesus said this in John 15 and verse 18. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before you, before it hated you. Jesus didn't say, follow me and everybody will like you. Matter of fact, he said, the world hated me, come be my follower. In John 16 and verse 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you, ha you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now that's good news, he overcame the world, but he said what? In the world you're gonna have tribulation. I've never seen that on a Christian t-shirt. Right, I've never seen a church use that as their theme verse. In the world you're gonna have tribulation. Hebrews chapter 11, and I wanna as we kind of come to a conclusion or a closing this morning, Hebrews 11 is often known as the faith chapter, right? It starts out talking about what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It, it describes faith. And then it goes and it starts to describe men and women of great faith, and down in verse 32 of Hebrews 11, it says this. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me. He's coming towards the end. Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. Also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the, uh, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That sounds awesome, doesn't it? I mean, that... We're, we're marching in faith. Right in to verse 34. Women, or 35. Women received their dead race to life again. Others were tortured. What? What? Stopping the mouths of lions. We're having great victory. Strength out of weakness. But others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were cut in half. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Hebrews 11 indicates that sometimes things end tragically. That everything doesn't always come out great in the end in this life. And we, we know that that's true, don't we? I mean, suffering and injustice are all around us. Matter of fact, sometimes it seems like that's the norm rather than the exception. 
And, and, and that can upset us and, and we can look to God and say, why? Why won't you intervene? Why won't you judge? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem good. But God's perspective is not our perspective. And as I thought about this, I thought about probably no greater example than the disciples themselves. These men who followed Christ. And originally, if you go back and look, they were looking for release from the Roman oppression that was taking place at that time. See, the Jews of that day did exactly what we do. They looked at what they were going through and they applied the Bible to their perspective right then. They were under Roman occupation. They, they no longer had independence. They could no longer just worship and govern themselves. The Roman Empire controlled everything and they had to pay taxes to the Rom Romans. They were subservient to them. But the Bible prophesied that a Messiah would come and that a Messiah would establish his kingdom and that a Messiah would deliver his people. And so Jesus comes on the scene and they believe that he's the Messiah and he, he is. And so they start to follow him thinking that what's he gonna do? He's gonna establish his kingdom. He's gonna deliver his people from who? The Romans. But then he was killed on a Roman cross. His kingdom was spiritual and not earthly. The deliverance that he offered, we know to be greater than just freedom from the Romans, but freedom, we have freedom from sin, but to the disciples, that's why the crucifixion was so devastating. And then he rises again from the dead and the Holy Spirit comes after his ascension and they begin to understand and, and they proclaim Jesus Christ throughout the world and he had promised to return and for them they believed that they were gonna see that. But tradition tells us that every one of those disciples was killed for their faith, except for John. He was just boiled in oil and sent to the island of Patmos in isolation for a while. His life didn't end real cheery either. And you think, well, that's not what I want. That's not what we think we're getting into when we follow Jesus. But see, God says our life's a vapor. And we get so concerned about this world. And I think about that for myself. How much time do I spend worried about the things of this earth? I mean, as a pastor, you know, I've got the responsibility of all these physical buildings. And the truth is that takes up a lot of time. We spend a lot of time and energy at our church in our food bank, feeding people. Now, that's biblical for us to do and I'm say, not saying we shouldn't do that. It's biblical for us to be good stewards of, this, of this, these facilities that God has given to us. But the truth is, one day, all of that will be burned up. None of it matters. It's only what will last for eternity. And again, I don't want to make light of your situation. I don't want to make light of tragedies that come in the lives of other people. But what I do want to say this morning is God has an eternal perspective. And as followers of him, we ought to try to adopt that same perspective. I want to close with this verse this morning. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. I put on your notes, I believe, 18 through 39. We're not going to read uh, 21 verses this morning. 
but I would encourage you to. But verse 18 says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now think with me for a moment. Because the sufferings of this present time are pretty bad, are they not? I mean, he wasn't talking about a hangnail. I mean, I see some, you know, we've got people in our church and I know people that with medical conditions that just for years and years they've been in pain and in suffering and I think how difficult that is. I see people who endure tragedies and, and circumstances that I think are just beyond imagination. And yet, Scripture tells us the sufferings of this world can't even compare. I think about the question that was asked. Six million people just exterminated and treated less than human, less than animals. And the suffering of this world is not to be compared to the glories of the next. Next week, we're going to talk about heaven. And I'm excited about that. And I would encourage you to be here. But I would like you, as you think about this question, that the truth of the answer is, I don't know why God did not spare those six million Jews. What I do know is God is a loving and a good God. And to walk by faith and to follow him by faith sometimes means that we endure suffering and difficulties. And we don't always see the end. But we do have his promise. We have his promise that nothing we endure here, it won't even compare to eternity. I think about those people who suffer and the the difficulties that their body gives them. And then I think the Bible says that in eternity, we will have a body that that is glorified and perfect. I can't even imagine. I'll be honest with you. I can't even imagine getting up in the morning and not popping and creaking and grinding. It's a little symphony. I can't even imagine what it's like to walk with no pain, let alone to run and to jump. The glories of this world are not, or the sufferings of this world are not to be compare. I don't have an answer for why everything happens that happens, but I know we can trust the one whose ways and thoughts are far above ours. Let's pray this morning. Dear God,